pleasure being in Toronto and uh, pleasure being and sharing the stage with Greg, who, uh, in addition to being a friend and comrade, is someone who I always find very inspiring. When I read Greg's uh, essays... I'm usually too pessimistic. No, 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 not at all. No, actually, uh, there have been moments when I've been extremely pessimistic and read uh, your essays, and, and uh, it's, it's turned me around. And so I very much appreciate that. So, um, I'm going to take a lot of risks tonight and commit several heresies. And, uh, and I think that it's important to do that in the context of talking about this, this very, very uh, incredibly important subject about the right, or what we actually should understand as the rights. Um, and, and that's actually where I want to start, that the left generally conflates different tendencies that are on the political right into one thing. And we also tend to be very instrumental in looking at the existence of these formations. So for example, in the question of fascism, um, I, I have to uh, uh, acknowledge the contributions of Nicolas Poulensas and his uh, incredible work, Fascism and Dictatorship which I still recommend that people take a look at. Um, fascism for the left has generally been anything we don't like. <laughs> if we don't like it and it's brutal, it's fascist. And, and it's interesting because essentially what that ends up doing is it leads us to romanticize bourgeois democracy. It actually leads us to believe that bourgeois democracy is much more peaceful and rational than it is. Rather than recognizing that democratic capitalism is incredibly brutal, incredibly violent, uh, and makes use of extrajudicial measures on a regular basis. Uh, and and so, that's, so that's like point number one. The other point is that there are different forms of authoritarian or right-wing states. It's not just fascism. When, when, uh, one of the things that, uh, in terms of what Greg was saying about pre-World War II, there were certain fascist states, but then there were also right-wing states that were not fascist. They were monarchist, or they were uh, dominated by a military junta or something. They might have been pro-fascist, but they weren't precisely fascists. When I'm talking about fascism, and again, borrowing from uh, Poulain Sass, but I'm not placing the responsibility for this heresy on him. Um, fascism is actually an incredibly revolutionary force. It's not conservative at all. It is revolutionary and it is irrationalist. And that is, that, so in other words, when we're looking at fascism, we're not looking at the traditional conservatives who are just bad and using extrajudicial measures. We're looking at a social movement that has a very different agenda than most conservative movements. Fascism, in many respects, seeks to burn the deadwood within capitalism away so that new forms of accumulation can emerge and new, uh, a new alignment can take place within the power block. It is not so much attempting to protect what exists, it's actually introducing something else. And, and so I think from, uh, this is important because it has very strategic implications in terms of how we respond to this. What is the social base? What is motivating these kind of movements that are not identical? Uh, so I, I think it's important to, to begin at that point. The second thing which Poulat Sass takes up is that the two major forms of 20th century fascism actually emerged when the left was on decline. Now, that is in Germany and Italy. That, that much of our discourse on the left is that fascism 
is a response by the bourgeoisie to our strength. And Poulain Sass pretty much demonstrated that that's not the case, at least in terms of Germany and Italy, that, that the movements there were actually declining and when fascism emerged. Now, there are other movements. I mean, one can look at the uh, rise of the right in Spain, what has been often dis described as fascism, the Francoist period. And that, you could say, was an emergence in response to a left. But it's not entirely clear to me that one could accurately describe that as a fascist movement, as opposed to a pro-fascist, very conservative movement. Um, so we have to begin there in understanding that the state can take different forms. The right can uh, uh, manifest itself in, in different ways. And that just because of a res resorting to brutality, extrajudicial uh, measures, et cetera, does not and should not lead us to automatically identify a phenomenon as fascist, which takes me to the second point which is, um, I think, very much in line with what Greg was raising. I would define what we've been seeing in the advanced capitalist world as the rise of a neoliberal authoritarian state. And this is what uh, Gapacin and I talked about in Solidarity Divided. That uh, Pilatsas talked about authoritarian statism. We, we're looking at, at something that has been noticeably changing in the advanced capitalist world since the late 70s. It is not restricted to any one country, but you see this um, very demonstrable restriction on democracy. You see a collapse of civil rights, a restriction on the civil rights. You see a restriction and a closing in on the parameters of what's considered legitimate discourse. And, and uh, you, can, you can identify that, for example, in watching what passes for debate on television. Uh, and you compare what, with, what is being debated now with what might have been debated in the different views 20 or 30 years ago. And the differences, I mean, these, there is absolutely this narrowing that one can see. We see the uh, increasing uh, surveillance. Uh, taking place both in, uh, domestically and internationally. Um, the militarization of everything, including language. The increased use of terminology like about war. The war against this, the war against that, the war against everything else. And as was demonstrated in the aftermath of the recent murder in Ferguson, Missouri, and the uprising that took place, all of a sudden it turns out that the cops seem like they're better on than the US military. Okay? And so there's this militarization that takes place at the same time that the rest of the public sector is being squeezed uh, very, very dramatically. So this authoritarianism that we're witnessing seems to be driven by multiple factors. But I would argue that to a great extent, and I think that this is in line with what Greg is raising, is that it's preemptive. Um, as, as opposed to responding to our strength, in some ways it's preemptive in light of the neoliberal austerity squeeze that's going on, plus something else, which is the environmental crisis. It's interesting to take note that the Pentagon has been doing a lot of planning around military responses to the environmental crisis, and particularly the anticipation of mass migrations into the global north from the global south as climate change uh, steps up and the impact that this will have on uh, islands as well as other parts of the global south. So that you end up having this austerity and wealth polarization that uh, results from uh, neoliberal capitalism along with this issue of the uh, environmental crisis. And the, so the environmental crisis actually presents this question for us, or for, for the capitalists, as to how are they going to respond. While there are, in fact, those that continue to deny climate change, at least that's what their words are, I would argue that much deeper within the class, the capitalist class, they appreciate the extent of uh, the, uh, the environmental crisis, 
and are attempting right now to identify how to prepare for that. Uh, and that may take some incredibly draconian uh, steps, including ultimately possibly people living under the earth. And I don't mean that in any way facetiously. Um, now, the neoliberal authoritarian state does not necessarily mean fascism. As I mentioned before, there are various forms of the capitalist state and various forms of an extraordinary capitalist state. The, the neoliberal authoritarian state can certainly have an electoral system. But the opportunities for popular involvement will be narrow. And along with that, there will be uh, uptake in repression. So, the neoliberal authoritarian state. But now there's this other thing that I think we have to grapple with, which is the phenomena of right-wing populism. And this, we cannot afford to, to conflate this with the neoliberal authoritarian state. When, when I'm looking at this uh, right-wing populism, I would say in the United States, the principal form of this, or the stage, perhaps one could uh, call it, is neo-confederate. Um, what do I mean by that? That, that, that right-wing populism in the United States draws its actual ideological inspiration from the Confederate States of America. And that the right wing in the United States is it's very, very diverse. But when you look at some of the, the very central themes in the mass right wing, it all ends up drawing, going back towards, uh, towards the Confederacy. Um, the Confederacy, which was racist, authoritarian, militarist, national chauvinist, state, states' rights, and a weakened central government. These themes become something that's very central in right-wing populism in the United States, and that's what I'm gonna, I need to focus on here. Right-wing populism in the United States um, is strange because in one level, it exists in contradiction with the neoliberal authoritarian state. And this is something that you find when you actually start to examine some of these right-wing formations. They actually hate the state. Uh, and they have, their, they have a very developed critique of the state. And they see the state as authoritarian. Um, and they also are deeply, deeply concerned about what we would call perhaps the rise of, of transnational capitalism. Uh, there's this deep chauvinist xenophobia that exists there so that these right-wing populist movements frequently are at odds, and this is one of the paradoxes for us on the left. We get very confused because the right wing, there are right wing formations and movements that seem to have, seem to have a similar critique to many of us on the left. This is something that emerged in the Occupy movement and has emerged in some other movements, and it's something for, uh, about which we have to be very, very careful that the right wing populace and particularly when you start going to the, the extreme like the neo-fascists, can articulate revolutionary language that can sound profoundly similar to many of our own critiques of the system. And that's where there is an immense danger uh, uh, for, for the left and for popular movements as a whole. Right-wing right populism uh, is, in the United States is rooted in white male revanchism which is, uh, Vanch is a meaning re revenge, which is related to the changing role of the United States, the rise of a transnational capitalist class, the dramatically changing demographics of the United States, which uh, moving away from being a white republic to something else, uh, the declining living standard, and this deep fear within the white so-called middle strap about what's happening. If you look and study the Tea Party, for example, their base is not the white working class. Their base rests within, actually, the traditional base of fascism. It's the, 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 the white middle strap that the Tea Party is based in, and it's, and it's not based on people that have lost. It's based among people that fear that they are going to lose. 
And, and, and so, you know, much of the way that, the, for example, the Tea Party has been presented, you would think it was a movement of the white working class, when that's not what's going on at all. Uh, it is a movement, uh, when they've done the study of it, studies of it, they indicate that the movement is obviously very white. Uh, it is a strata that identified, and it is older. It is baby boomers and above who are absolutely panicked about the changes that are underway uh, in, in the states. Um, now, right-wing populism, as I mentioned before, has various trends that range from the self-proclaimed neo-confederates, to be distinguished from who I was speaking before, to Christian identity forces, to neo-fascists. The Southern Poverty Law Center reported that there are approximately 688 of these kind of groups talking about extreme right-wing groups, uh, and many of them are armed. Um, and when I say armed, I don't mean that they have shotguns or that they're carrying 45 pistols. I'm talking about rocket-propelled grenades, mortars, 50 caliber machine guns, MAC-10s, you know, AR-15s. These are, these are folks that are anticipating and planning for uh, the final conflict. They have carried out more terror attacks in the U.S. since 9-11 than any group associated with uh, uh, Islamic terror. And they've killed more law enforcement officers. Now, I just want to stop at that point for one second just to emphasize that that last information you're not going to hear on Fox News. <laughs> right? But not just Fox News. You're not hearing it in any of the mainstream. Right? When, what's interesting is that when there is even one person who claims that maybe their, uh, their third cousin was Muslim and they decide that they're going to carry out something, the media will focus on them and tie that to so-called Islamic terror. But when there is the killing of law enforcement officers, the, the harassment of Jews, you know, the, uh, the, the killing of, of people of color by these organized right-wing forces, it's always treated as if it's an isolated problem. You could even look at what happened when Timothy McVeigh carried out the murder in Oklahoma City. When the bombing first took place, the immediate assumption in the media was that Muslims had carried it out. And there was this incredible frenzy. He got to find these Muslim terrorists. When they discovered that it was a homegrown white boy, all of a sudden the entire discussion changed. The entire discussion changed. It was no longer about this frenzy. It was, we've got to understand what motivated Timothy McVeigh. As if someone tried to understand what motivated Mohammed Atta to fly the planes into the buildings. No one was trying to do that. It was this, we've got to understand, and, and Timothy McVeigh once it was a great patriot, what could have happened to him? And, and so instead of understanding the proliferation of these groups as part of a larger movement, all of this ends up becoming isolated and, and minimized in terms of its importance. Now, neo-confederate ideology has been growing and, um, and it's been taking various forms in the states. One is something called nullification, which is, uh, was something that arose before the US Civil War and it's the attempt to nullify uh, federal legislation and basically say that states can do this. If you followed anything of our, around our health care debates, you would start to hear this about nullification, attempts to get states to pull out of the Affordable Care Act. But there are other forms in which this issue of, uh, of nullification have arisen. There was this recent issue in Nevada where um, there was a farmer who was basically uh, using federal land uh, for his own gain. When the feds came in to, to deal with that, there was a mass popular response by the right wing that was very well armed, and they basically had a standoff with the Bureau of Land Management. And they claimed, and the right wing has been holding this up as examples of, of standing up to the state that they did it, they showed what happened and what, what uh, more needed to happen. Uh, 
right-wing populism is itself very contradictory. It largely argues against the lo globalization, while at the same time opposing socially progressive legislation and regulation that would safeguard people against the worst aspects of neoliberal globalization. But there are those within uh, right, the right-wing populist camp who support neoliberal globalization, and I think an example would be the Koch brothers. Now, this part, um, well, let me not qualify it. I, I think that in the States, we may be on a collision course. Uh, much of the radical left has assumed that the struggle down the road for socialism or for some sort of other social transformation would essentially be either class against class or it would be a kind of popular block against the capitalist state. And we never seem to factor in the right. We, either, we, we seem to think that either they're going to sit this one out or that they're just simply the same as the capitalist state. And um, I, I think that we're looking at a very different situation, one that might turn towards some form of uh, a second parts of the US Civil War, where we actually have two very different blocks. One that is, for lack of a better term, democratic constitutionalist versus neo-Confederate. Uh, and the, the terrain of this fight will be on the question of democracy and the expansion or contraction of democracy. A neo-confederate victory would place, uh, place us in a fascistic situation uh, with all of the corresponding horrors. Now what remains unclear is uh, what segments of the domestic bourgeoisie in the United States would align with a sort of neo-confederate direction. What sides would oppose this or stay neutral and watch the conflict unfold. In that sense, I go back to my first point, that when we thought about fascism as simply an instrument of the bourgeoisie, we were making a very big mistake. It is a social movement. At a certain point, it can align itself with a segment of the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie has its particular objectives. But none of that should lead us to underestimate the power of this kind of radical, irrationalist social movement that can, in fact, and has proven in the past, to touch the lives and minds and hearts of millions. Um, I will, uh, it's, it's perhaps within that context that you might remember a few <coughs> A couple of years ago, this Russian think tank said that they predicted that the United States would break up. And there were a lot of people that started laughing at that. I don't laugh at that anymore. Uh, and, and I know that probably for some of you, some of what I'm saying sounds like it's out of science fiction. But I don't, I don't laugh at that anymore because I look at what has happened with the growth of the Tea Party. I've looked at what's happened with the growth of these uh, this sort of neo-confederate movement. And in a situation where uh, our uh, rights and liberties are in fact being restricted, it seems to me entirely possible that we could have a situation where some of this, there ends up being a military option internally to the United States that is chosen by the right-wing populace or some segment of them. And this means that we have to really rethink strategy in some very, very fundamental ways. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.